All right, great to see everyone. I tried to find a, a podium that put me as close as I could to the ceiling. It's nice to feel imperious up here. Um, <laughs> it's good to see so many of you all, um, friends that I haven't seen in a while, and, uh, and a lot of you. This is uh, a week that's our third uh, year to do Free Speech Week, and um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to have our guest with us uh, here today. Um, you will get a more formal introduction of her here in a bit. We are longtime friends, now having known each other for over seven minutes. Um, uh, but, but I do know her work, uh, and we couldn't be more excited uh, to have here. Uh, I'm a former law school dean. She is a law school professor uh, who just took, uh, um, who just stepped out of the full-time teaching role. Uh, but she uh, uh, is, is uh, from uh, NY University, New York University. Uh, she's, she's got a number of, of, of works that you'll see. One of those we're excited to host this Thursday um, at our College of Journalism and Mass Communications uh, at the Gaylord College. It's a three-part series, uh, which is called Free to Speak. Uh, so if you get a chance, please come by and see that, or if you miss it, see it when it's broadcasted. Uh, it's a really important conversation, a, a conversation about democracy and our principles, universities, uh, and the principles that we are here uh, upon which we rest. I want to acknowledge a number of individuals who are here today um, that I know will be here. One of those, um, is Joanne Bell here? Oh, great. I'd like to introduce the former executive director of the ACLU of Oklahoma, Joanne Bell. Oh, I'm so sorry. You might introduce yourself to the group then. Yes, you're Michael Salem, who is a terrific civil rights advocate, uh, graduate of the OU College of Law, and we're thrilled to have you here. So let's recognize Michael Salem. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've had a, a couple of, uh, of folks that wanted to be here that could not be here, but I want to recognize two of them, one, whom is, one of, of whom is here, uh, co-chairs of OU's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Freedom of Speech and Inquiry Oversight Committee a committee which I think speaks directly to the intersection of those two components, uh, Dr. Belinda higgs Hypolite, uh, who could not be here, but also the moderator uh, for our upcoming conversation, Dr. Jeremy Bailey, who is director of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage and Sanders Chair in Law and Liberty in the Department of Classics and Letters. Let's recognize Dr. Jeremy Bailey. We were just talking a minute ago about the University of Oklahoma adopted about a year ago uh, the Chicago Principles on Free Speech, something about which we are very proud uh, and will continue to honor. Uh, we have a lot of alumni and friends that are here today. This is homecoming week. Uh, that's incredibly exciting. I want to thank all of those uh, that are here. I am mindful that we have a hard stop at 35 past the hour and that you did not come here uh, uh, to listen to me give my stock speeches. So uh, this is our third year. Uh, for us to have this, uh, and um, it's critical. It's critical to who we are as a people. It's critical to our democracy that we honor free speech, um, and it's critical to us as an institution. We think about what we do. Uh, the creation and dissemination of knowledge only takes place whenever there's an opportunity for free speech and inquiry. Uh, this is our obligation to society, and at this point, I'll turn this over to Dr. Jeremy Bailey. All right, thanks for being here. Uh, let me introduce uh, our guest, which is a real, real um, treat. So Nadine Strawson served as president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008 and held the John Marshall Harlan II Professorship of Law at New York Law School. She's now a senior fellow with FIRE, that's the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. She serves on the advisory boards of the ACLU the Academic Freedom Alliance uh, with Keith Whittington, uh, who came here three years, two years ago, Heterodox Academy, National Coalition Against Censorship, and the University of Austin. She's also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, on Foreign Relations. She has testified in front of Congress on multiple occasions. The National Law Journal has named Strassen one of America's most 100 influential lawyers, and several other publications have named her one of the country's most influential women. Her many honorary degrees and awards include the American Bar Association's prestigious Mar Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award 2017, and in 2023, the National Coalition Against Censorship selected Strassen for its Judy Bloom Lifetime Achievement Award for Free Speech. 
She's the author of many books, including Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship, published in 2018. And Free Speech, published by Oxford University Press, um, What Everyone Needs to Know, which is hot off the press, by the way. Her book, Hate, was selected as the common read, that is the, the read for all incoming students, by Washington University in St. Louis and Washburn University. She's also the host and project consultant for Free to Speak, a three-hour documentary film series on free speech scheduled for release in which we will screen at the Gaylord School later this year. It was this week, excuse me, on Thursday. Her 1995 book, Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights, was named a New York Times notable book of that year and will be republished in 2024 as part of New York University Press's classic series. Strawson has made thousands of public presentations before diverse audiences around the world, including more than 500 college campuses and in many foreign countries. She's appeared on almost every new, uh, national TV news network program. Her hundreds of publications have been appeared in many scholarly and generalist uh, publications. Let me say this. Um, if Jefferson said that um, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, and Professor Strawson has spent her entire career in that service, and that the way she's done so, and the way she's been recognized by people on the left and right is a testimony to the importance of that work. For example, when she stepped down as ACLU president, three Supreme Court justices participated in her farewell tribute. Those three justices were Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Antonin Scalia, and David Souter. Strawson graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard College and magnum cum laude from Harvard Law School. Before becoming a law professor, she practiced law in Minneapolis, which is her hometown, and practiced law in New York City as well. Please give a big OU welcome to Professor Nadine Strawson. Thank you so much for that generous introduction by President Harris and by Jeremy. We decided we could be on a first name basis, and I want to say I'm so uh, thrilled about the support that President Harris and the faculty and regents have shown by, to free speech by celebrating Free Speech Week, which is not yet celebrated on every campus. We're going to work on that. Uh, and also adopting the Chicago free speech principles as a sign of respect for your school. I've uh, worn well, the closest to your color that I have in my wardrobe, and thank you for having such a pretty color. All right, thank you. Let's, um, we're at a university, and students sometimes have to practice elevator pitches. Uh, so what would be your elevator pitch for free speech? Free speech is the absolutely essential prerequisite, not only for individual self-fulfillment, for uh, exploring and developing our own identities and ideas and beliefs, but it is also the essential prerequisite for protecting every other human right and for advocating every other cause, including paradoxically, anti, the anti-free speech cause. And finally, it is essential, uh, as President Harris alluded to, for the pursuit of truth, especially important, not only in an academic community such as OU, but also in a democratic republic such as the United States, where we the people, to quote the opening words of the Constitution, wield sovereign power, we can't do that responsibly unless we have the maximum freedom to vigorously debate and discuss and critique public officials and public policies. All right, um, so you gave your pitch. Um, free speech has become contested, even, even controversial um, recently. Um, it's not so clear for many students, many professors, many journalists, many news associations um, that free speech is a value that needs to be defended. Why do you think there's been a change? Why has it become more contested in recent years? Well, I'm going to exercise my right to dissent by saying, Jeremy, throughout my entire adult lifetime, not to pull the age card on you, but a few more decades, 
Um, freedom of speech has always been embattled, as uh, uh, observers liked to quip, but it's quite accurate. Just about everybody believes in freedom of speech for me, or people who think like me, but not for thee. So throughout my entire adult lifetime, I've had to defend freedom for the most controversial ideas, and which ideas are controversial will depend on people's political perspectives. But um, to, I think, in fairness, what is different in the most recent past is that even in institutions that traditionally have had special commitments to free speech, we have seen those commitments eroding. What I've been talking about before uh, has mostly been from the general public and from politicians. But of greatest concern to me and why I decided to focus full time on this issue for the last half dozen or so years is that we have seen erosion of support for free speech in academia, in journalism, in publishing, in cultural institutions, among librarians, even, dare I say, among human rights and civil liberties organizations. Okay, so let's get to the, to the hard stuff. Um, my understanding is, is you're the, the, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, and yet you support the right of, say, neo-Nazis uh, to, to give their speech. Um, now, there's two views out there, and one, one view is that uh, the First Amendment forces us to uh, allow that kind of speech. And, and there's another view out there that says, well, no, the First Amendment has no room for, for, for that kind of hate speech. Um, which position is right, and how do you make sense of this? So I defend freedom of speech for the speech that we hate, for the thought that we hate, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, not despite the fact that I'm Jewish and the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, uh, but because of those facts, freedom of speech is absolutely essential to everyone, as I tried to explain in my elevator pitch, but it is always and logically especially important for members of minority groups and traditionally marginalized and disempowered groups, whether that be religious minorities, racial minorities, uh, political minorities. Why? Because by definition, we are never going to have the degree of influence over the majoritarian accountable branches of government, right? Those which appropriately are responsive to the major interest groups, the major demographic groups that they are representing. By definition, it is individuals, minority groups, especially those who are unpopular, who are the most dependent on freedom of speech and the other First Amendment rights to try to influence public policy. Now that said, Jeremy, if I may, um, the First Amendment appropriately does not absolutely protect all speech, regardless of what the subject or content of the speech is. So a lot of hateful speech, including anti-Semitic speech, can and should be punished, consistent with what we lawyers often call the emergency principle. Government may restrict speech when the speech directly, imminently, causes or threatens certain specific serious harm. And the Supreme Court has recognized several subcategories of speech that satisfy that emergency principle, which a lot of hate speech does satisfy. For example, intentional incitement of imminent violent or lawless conduct that is likely to happen imminently, or a targeted true threat in the sense that the speaker intends to instill a reasonable, objective fear on the part of targeted audience members that they are going to be subject to a violent attack, targeted harassment or intimidation or bullying. So the hate speech that causes the most harm because it satisfies the emergency principle 
appropriately can be punished. But what our law says government may not do is punish the speech solely because of dislike, even loathing, of the viewpoint, the content, the idea, or because of a general, more speculative fear that it might indirectly, potentially, at some point, lead to harm. That's you, we, that was the standard we used to have in this country, and other countries still have it. We often call that the bad tendency standard. Well, just about all speech could potentially lead to harm, and once you give the government that discretionary power to pick and choose from all the speech that satisfies the bad tendency test, what will be censored, not surprisingly, it is over and over again dissident speech and speech by and on behalf of minority groups. It was under the bad tendency test that throughout US history we had censorship of every movement for social justice and human rights and for various progressive uh, causes from abolitionism to women's suffrage to the labor union movement to anti-war movement to racial segregation to LGBTQ plus rights. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm in, I hear like an objection in my head that somebody might, might give. And they, it might be something like this. Okay, let's say you have the First Amendment right, uh, but maybe the First Amendment's wrong. And, and may, maybe the First Amendment's wrong because um, this sort of content neutrality uh, sort of principle really favors majoritarian power and that uh, the disadvantaged or the, the people who were oppressed and, 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 and you know, in, in history or, or now are gonna be disadvantaged by a process that treats everyone as if they're equal in the marketplace of ideas, but it's true that in fact, some people have a microphone. So um, what, what do you say to people who hold that concern? It's a very important concern, and I hoped that I preempted it at least to some extent by explaining why, as a logical matter, it is precisely those who lack majoritarian power, whether it be majoritarian political or economic or other power, who are going to be most dependent on freedom of speech. And if you look at the, and most victimized by censorship, and if you look at not only the history of the United States, but around the world, you will see consistent patterns to this day that even censorship laws that are designed specifically to protect minority interests, such as hate speech laws, are consistently disproportionately enforced against speech by those very minority groups. So in my 2018 book about hate speech, I quote many human rights champions from around the world who oppose censoring hate speech beyond the emergency principle not because it violates the free speech standards in their countries. No, in their countries it's perfectly permissible to outlaw hate speech, but specifically from the perspective of what is actually going to benefit as opposed to stifle minority causes, their experience has been that those laws are disproportionately silencing, ironically, but predictably, the very minority groups who are supposed to be helped. Now that said, Jeremy, if I can just amplify, I think that the, to me the First Amendment is, which prohibits government uh, violation of free speech rights, um, that is necessary but not sufficient to have meaningful free speech in our society. And I think it's really important for us, especially in a university community, to take affirmative steps to make sure that everybody, every member of this community is empowered and encouraged and emboldened and enabled to meaningfully exercise freedom of speech. And we do that by dealing with some of the inequalities that you refer to, to make sure that as many people as possible have the educational wherewithal and the technological knowledge and even, may I say, the psychological 
uh, resilience to be able to not just appreciate free speech as some theoretical abstract right, but as a right that they are vigorously exercising as equal members of our community. Okay, thank you. Um, so shifting gears a little bit. So one, one question is hate speech. Uh, another one has to do with what people might call misinformation. And so just a couple of recent examples. Um, and coming from 2020, um, lots of things out there about, say, COVID and the vaccine and whether or not the vaccine is gonna do all these terrible things to you. Um, lots of stuff out there about election results and uh, why votes were counted a certain way. Um, just a lot of really crazy things out there that people, for whatever reason, latch onto and believe, and we live in an environment in which it's amplified uh, by, by you know, this thing in our hands. Um, so what does you know, your principle, what does the First Amendment principle do for, for this, this very real problem for democratic governance that you know, we can't trust each other because we seem to, we can't even trust information anymore. You know, Jeremy, I thought it was interesting that you referred to what is perceived as or what is called misinformation because that underscores a um, central problem about this concept, which is the same as the central problem uh, with respect to hate speech, that it is an inherently subjective concept. One person's hated disinformation or fake news, to use a synonym for it, is somebody else's cherished truth, just the way one person's hate speech is somebody else's uh, cherished speech. So beyond speech, false speech, that satisfies the emergency concept, it is very dangerous to empower government to pick and choose which allegedly false ideas will be suppressed. So examples of false speech that may and should be restricted by government because they do directly and imminently cause certain specific serious harm are libel or defamation, uh, fraud, perjury. Uh, and when we get beyond, and, and those are fairly narrowly defined appropriately, there has to be intentional uh, misleading of somebody, and you, there has to be a demonstrable harm from relying on the false speech. But when we talk about these more subjective concepts, it, we see the same pattern that we see with the subjective concept of hate speech, that over and over and over again, who is punished is somebody who is criticizing government policy or dissenting from government policy, including about COVID. Uh, this happened in the United States shortly after the pandemic began. Uh, Puerto Rico enacted a couple of anti-disinformation laws allegedly for the purpose of protecting public health. The ACLU immediately went to court on behalf of two very respected uh, investigative journalists who said, look, no matter how conscientious we are, when you're dealing with a fast-breaking situation with you know, all kinds of new information and analysis, and you wanna provide the maximum information to inform people, not only because of concerns about free speech, but because of life-saving and health-saving concerns, it's inevitable that you're gonna make some mistakes, but you're gonna be chilled if you fear that you're subject to criminal punishment. And uh, uh, recently, the federal judge agreed with us and said, especially in the context of a crisis, such as a public health crisis, it's especially important that we give maximum latitude to the press. And you talk about distrust. I agree with you, Jeremy, that a democracy cannot flourish if we have such a deep uh, degree of distrust in institutions, including the press. Uh, that is, is very corrosive of democracy. On the other extreme, too much uh, credulity. You know, believing everything you read or hear is also dangerous to democracy. That's a problem with disinformation, right? So I think we all have to inculcate in ourselves a healthy degree of skepticism and second-guessing and re-examining uh, everything that's out there. 
Okay, so what if, what if, um, what if somebody say, well, look, do we really have to be patient with a person who insists that the earth is flat or that the Holocaust never happened? You know, what, what, is, what is the value to society for putting up with these people? And isn't it possible that they can gain huge audiences, you know, on Twitter by, by saying such outlandish things? You know, I recently had the honor of speaking at a conference at which Salman Rushdie also spoke. And uh, he was answering a question, very similar question, that was focused on Holocaust denial. And he said, you know, putting the Holocaust denier in jail is not going to eliminate Holocaust denialism. You know, our goal is to eliminate or greatly reduce the amount of disinformation, certainly to reduce the number of people who believe the disinformation. But I would argue, and I think evidence um, uh, supports the conclusion, that suppressing the speech is not going to eradicate the dangerous or misleading idea. To the contrary, we have a lot of evidence uh, for a number of reasons that it will actually amplify that message. There's something called the forbidden fruits phenomenon, right? Uh, you try to suppress an idea, and suddenly people become very interested in it. The Holocaust is, is a really a poignant example itself because many people say, oh, if only the Weimar Republic during which Hitler rose to power, if only they had outlawed hate speech, uh, maybe the Hitler would not have risen to power and the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. I would certainly uh, have favored that, having many relatives who were, who were brutally slaughtered. Um, the truth is that in the Weimar Republic, there were very strict anti-hate speech laws, anti-disinformation laws, and they were enforced against the Nazis. And the Nazis very strategically used the trials as propaganda platforms to gain attention that they otherwise would never have received uh, and sympathy that they otherwise never would have received. Unfortunately, people who believe in conspiracy theories, evidence shows, are gonna be more persuaded that the theory is true if powerful officials and other societal forces try to suppress the idea. They say, oh, you know, there must be something to it. Why would they be so afraid of the idea? So I'm not saying we should be passive. We should vigorously exercise our own free speech rights to contest and debate and maybe even to ignore. You know, that's another uh, important strategy here. And we also have to educate, and this is really important in the u university environment, educate people to do their own fact checking, to have media literacy, to have information literacy. Uh, unfortunately, we have focused so much on the supply side here. We're never gonna eliminate the supply of disinformation or hate speech or other controversial speech. We have to eliminate people's demand for it, right? Isn't this what we've learned from other pro failed prohibition strategies? Okay, I'm gonna shift gears again, um, and this time ask a question that probably hits a little closer to home for, for, for us uh, affiliated with, with you know, university and higher education. And, and I'm thinking in particular of legislation in Florida, um, which Governor DeSantis calls the Stop Woke Act, um, that has uh, implications for curriculum. Um, it's had some trouble in the courts. Um, what, what, is, what is going on in Florida, and what, what are your thoughts about it? It's going on in Florida and a number of other states, including this one and, and many others, um, where, ironically, legislatures and governors who are Republicans and conservatives who have been highly critical of liberal and progressive students and faculty members who complain that they should not be exposed to ideas that make them uncomfortable or that are divisive. And you know, the these are generalizations, so forgive me, but um, the ge many conservatives and Republicans have, have mocked those students and faculty members as snowflakes. You know, you don't have a right to be protected from uncomfortable or divisive ideas. And yet that very same rhetoric has been adopted and incorporated in these laws and in executive orders that seek to protect 
uh, students from curricular materials or books or ideas that uh, make anybody feel uncomfortable or are divisive on the basis of race and gender and you know these very sensitive and very important uh, issues of public policy. When we're talking about a state legislature or a public university that's bound by the First Amendment, that viewpoint neutrality and content neutrality principle that you talked about, Jeremy, applies here. That no legislature may outlaw any discussion uh, or any curricular treatment or library books that uh, deal with a particular viewpoint or subject matter or topic, it would be equally unconstitutional to say schools must teach the 1619 Project as to say schools may not teach the 1619 pro Project. This is a matter to be handled by the educational experts at the campus and K through 12 level. Okay, so follow up on that. Um, so there's an activist, uh, Christopher Rufo, uh, who's been involved uh, in Florida and elsewhere. And he's got a pretty big um, uh, presence in, in these conversations. And he would say something like the following, well look, the people of Florida elected their state legislatures. The state legislature has a broad mandate to shape the curriculum. For example, the state legislature may require US history or it may not. It may require calculus, it may not. It may require writing, it may not. And so state legislatures do this all the time, and, and in fact, that's because they have control over their state universities. Um, what's your response to that kind of counter, counter response? So what is being discussed is really one of those delicate balances, that's a proverbial concept that uh, we who talk about the US Constitution and government often use. On the one hand, we are uh, essentially democratic, majoritarian system of government. The Constitution appropriately vests majorities through their elected representatives, including in the state legislature and on the local school board, power to make most policy decisions, including curricular decisions, except the framers, in their wisdom, did not create a pure democracy. They said there are some rights that are so fundamental that no majority, no matter how strong, may deprive a minority of those rights, no matter how small or unpopular, even hated, that minority might be. And of course, one of those cherished fundamental rights is free speech, First Amendment rights. So, if a law that regulates the curriculum violates First Amendment rights, then the First Amendment results in that law being unconstitutional. Okay, all right, great. Let's um, think about the way universities think about themselves. Um, so um, I'm thinking about, this is more, I, I suppose it's an can cancel culture um, sort of arena, but um, there's a talk um, by a kind of conservative provocateur uh, a couple of years ago at Berkeley um, in which the threat of um, disruption and perhaps even violence um, by students, um, I believe, led administrators to, to cancel the, 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 the talk. Um, what, what would you say to... Um, university leaders and to students uh, who find themselves in, in that situation? Obviously, violence is illegal and should be punished, and credible threats of violence should, are also illegal and should be punished, consistent with the emergency principle that I alluded to. That said, um, there is a concept that became current in First Amendment law during the Civil Rights Movement, the concept of the heckler's veto, uh, because the strategy that was used in many Southern communities to stop peaceful, pro-civil rights, anti-segregation uh, and racial discrimination 
demonstrations to stop them from going forward, the community officials would say, oh, but there's threatened violence by audience members or community members who find these ideas so controversial and so upsetting that if we are to protect public safety, including of the pro-civil rights demonstrators, we have to prevent the demonstration. And the Supreme Court rightly said, no, that is empowering the hecklers, those who are opposing the speakers, with veto power over the free speech rights of not only demonstrators, but members of the community who wanted to hear their message. So the first obligation of government is to provide the physical security, the law enforcement protection and prevention of violence. Uh, and only if, you know, in extraordinary, exceptional circumstances where for some legitimate reason, law enforcement cannot do its job and the only way to protect against violence is to shut down the event, then as a last resort, the speech may be canceled. And you know, I have to say, it's, it's tough for universities, uh, as we saw at Berkeley itself, because sometimes providing that security can be extremely costly. And the Supreme Court has said, you know, you can't put a price tag on free speech, no matter how costly the secure physical security is. Um, free speech is even, it, it, losing free speech is even more costly. So, so what would you say to a student who says, look, this really, and I'm not speaking of anyone in, in particular here, but this really vile person is coming to my campus to give really vile and discredited uh, ideas. Why should I, as a student, let you know my university, which I love, provide this person a platform? Don't I have a moral obligation to figure out a way to, to de-platform the speaker? What's your advice to, to, that, to that student who's let me uh, quote two organizations that are expert in countering extremism and hatred. And I know that, um, as with all organizations, there will be some people who disagree with or criticize some things they've done, but uh, as do I. The Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center a couple of years ago put out what I think is a terrific a manual for guidance, guidebook for students who had exactly that question, Jeremy, because at that point, um, Richard Spence and several other people who were seen as right-wing provocateurs and advocates of, of white supremacy even were planning campus tours. And a lot of students and faculty members and other com university community members uh, understandably felt very upset about this. And that brochure from these groups who devote themselves to countering hatred and extremism said, please exercise restraint. We know it will feel very morally satisfying to try to de-platform these people, but you will just be playing into their hands. That is exactly the strategy that they're banking on for to garner the attention that they otherwise would not receive, which leads to some sympathy and support that they otherwise would not receive. So we understand that you want to do something. Here are some other constructive things that we think are more strategically wise, consistent with your moral objection to the ideas. Number one, go to the student group or the faculty member, whoever it is that invited these speakers, and try to persuade them to retract the invitation. They may not understand how hurtful or how disinformative or how uh, you know, negative the impact will be. And there are situations where that has actually worked. If you want to express yourselves, have an affirmative event of your own in a totally different part of campus where you are affirmatively celebrating the positive values that you celebrate, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And, and that way you can do some good for your principles without 
inadvertently amplifying the very message that you want to deamplify. And I can tell you, there have been many situations where some of these provocateurs have spoken on campuses and you don't know about it because that is exactly the strategy that was followed and they got no media attention at all. All right, so um, thinking about faculty, I think I saw in this morning's stuff that, that somebody at Columbia, a faculty member, um, said or tweeted something that was perhaps uh, pro Hamas. Uh, there's a high profile event at Hamline University where a, a faculty member, um, I believe, um, used a, um, a depiction of Muhammad in class and was, was disciplined in some way. And the president, the quote is here, let me read it, said that Hamline University's uh, respect uh, decency and appreciation of religious and other differences should supersede academic freedom. What do you think? What limits should there be on expression on campus, both in classrooms and in other settings? Oh, Jeremy, I want to quote a great line that you had in a wonderful op-ed that was published this weekend uh, in the Tulsa newspaper and I think another newspaper, right? Yeah, uh, OKC. And um, it was very alliterative because you talked about this complicating factor that there are different areas of the university. And you used the alliterative phrase lecture halls, libraries, and lawns. And um, I hate to be complicated, but the law sensibly is very fact specific. So the academic freedom standards in a uh, a lawn, which is the equivalent of a public park, is basically everybody can say anything on any viewpoint whatsoever. It's like the proverbial Hyde Park uh, in uh, corner in, in, in London. I mean, there can be what we lawyers call content neutral time, place, and manner rules, so you can't make so much noise that you interfere with a class in an adjacent building and so forth. Um, in, and then let me go to the opposite extreme, which is um, the lecture hall. A faculty member has academic responsibility as well as academic freedom. So if a faculty member who's teaching astronomy or geography teaches that the Earth is flat, that person can be fired because that for incompetence. Yeah, you may have a free speech right to say that as a citizen, including, I would argue, even in a tweet uh, or certainly standing out on a lawn, but not in a classroom. Okay, um, more on, on universities. And so if, if you're following um, the, the newspapers um, this past eight days, uh, a lot of high-profile universities have found themselves, um, I don't know, um, in public relations, relations fiascos would be a, a one way to put it, uh, issuing one statement on one day and then another statement on the next day trying to, to thread the needle on um, the way to respond to uh, the attack in Israel. Um, there is one proposed solution to that. It's called uh, the Calvin Report, which is yet another report coming out of the University of Chicago. Can you say something about that and whether or not you think it's a good idea for universities? The Calvin principles were adopted by the University of Chicago in 1967 and virtually unknown anywhere else until extremely recently as we've seen more and more pressure from more and more different constituents on more and more university leaders to pronounce um, positions on more and more public controversies. And the idea behind the Calvin principles was that the university as an institution should not appropriately comment on general political, cultural, social controversies unless they directly relate specifically to the university itself. So let's say there's a planned tax increase on the university or a planned seizure of university property for um, uh, eminent, under eminent domain powers. 
Uh, but beyond that, the university as an institution is neither an expert on these other public policy issues, nor can it possibly speak for all members of the campus community. There's no mechanism for doing that. And worse yet, when the university as an institution expresses a position, that has a chilling impact on the individual members of the community the students and the faculty members who are the ones who have a really important First Amendment right and academic freedom right to express their views. So the notion on the part of the University of Chicago Calvin principles was that we will maximize the freedom of speech of every member of this campus community uh, if we as an institution don't address these issues. And I would say, as you alluded to, Jeremy, there's also a real practical drain on university leaders' time now that I think could be much, I'm sure many would agree, could be much better spent on areas where they are expert, uh, namely matters relating specifically to university governance. All right, so just a quick concrete example. Um, I went to Rhodes College a small private school in Memphis for my undergraduate degree, should Rhodes College issue a statement on the invasion of the Ukraine? First of all, let me be very clear that the Calvin principles and yours truly are not denying that there is a free speech right on the part of the institution. We have an implicit concept under the First Amendment of freedom of association and so especially when you're talking about a private institution, they have, a, and if, if it's religious, it's exercising freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, if it chooses to express a message that it deems to be consistent with its mission, including its religious values. Um, but the Calvin principles are simply saying, we urge all colleges to desist from doing that if they want to maximally um, uh, enhance the free speech and free exercise of religion and association rights for constituent units within that campus, not only individual faculty members and students, but let's say student groups and associations. All right, I'm gonna ask one quick question and then we'll turn it over to the audience for their questions. I'll try to make the answer uh, quick. If you had the ear of Justice John Roberts, what's the one thing the Supreme Court should fix about the First Amendment? about the First Amendment. Um, I would say it, it, this is gonna be, you know, it, there's not very much because I think th the Supreme Court has been doing an excellent job uh, on freedom of speech. Okay, but since you said the First Amendment, uh, the Supreme Court recently has completely gutted what used to be the Establishment Clause. Uh, many people think of it as separation of church and state. Uh, this Supreme Court has overturned decades of precedent uh, that, in my view, undermine uh, individual religious liberty because many people don't understand that a purpose of, in fact, one of the major purposes of uh, maintaining separation between government and religion was not only for the sake of maintaining the secular nature of our political system, but also maintaining the sacred nature of our religious sphere. Okay, let's turn it over to the audience. Uh, questions from the audience. Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, and a lot of what I've heard you say, um, and I've heard in different spaces that I'm in, with whether it's DEI related, uh, or military related uh, is this concept of absolute truth. And so my question to you in what you've shared, do you feel that free speech and the concept of absolute truth can coexist? I'm, could, I'm not sure what you mean by absolute truth. You're saying some people believe in that or pursue it? Yes, ma'am, what okay. I meant, um, an example would be um, that there are certain things, you, you kind of alluded to it, that there are certain things maybe from a moral standpoint or from a, 
um, society standpoint that are just right. For example, um, nobody should try to intentionally hurt somebody okay. else. Or uh, you should treat people um, with um, positive uh, regard and things of that nature. Um, and then there are some people who will say that absolute truth, quote unquote, uh, also means that you have to pick a side on one thing or another. Whereas maybe in free speech, um, it can come off or it can suggest that um, there is no absolute truth, that you know what I feel and what you feel are different. So my question is, can both concepts coexist in some way? Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Uh, I think that the two not only can coexist, but I really don't see how um, you could have individuals pursuing and adhering to and expressing their view of absolute truth unless you had freedom of speech, which means that it is not the government's business to decree what is true and what is false. In fact, the Supreme Court, going back to the disinformation question, um, recently upheld uh, the right to lie in a situation that did not fit into one of these ca narrow categories, defamation, fraud, and perjury, and alluding to George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, the Supreme Court said, we have no place in our system for the ministry of truth. Though you may remember that that was a government agency that was deciding what was true and what was false and outlawing words that conveyed a different perspective. They didn't want people to even be able to think of an idea that was contrary to government orthodoxy. So the more we allow individual orthodoxy in any realm, the more we have to oppose government putting its stamp of orthodoxy on any idea in any, any sphere. A question right here. Thank you. Uh, so excellent discussion on free speech, loved it. Um, one part of free speech is free expression. And this, this campus has had a very troubled history in terms of protecting students and staff for that. Part of free expression is makeup. So two students were punished for putting on black makeup, forced off a of campus. And it was just such a disgraceful thing. Do they, are they owed an apology for their free expression? I'm sorry that I'm not familiar with the facts of the case, but based on what you tell me, I think it would be not only unconstitutional, but unwise uh, to punish those students. And I'm thinking of one situation where, which was highly publicized uh, from this campus from 2015, uh, the fraternity that had racist, blatantly racist chants on um, some expedition. And not only did punishing them, I believe they were expelled, uh, violate their free speech rights according to a complete consensus of constitutional law experts. But I thought one of the most interesting explanations as to why that was also unwise uh, was written by Jamel Bowie, a very prominent progressive African American who's now a columnist for the New York Times, but at that time he was for Slate Magazine. And he said, you know, the response, you want, the response to this kind of blatant racist expression, if you want to be effective in changing their ideas, you know, assuming blackface is, is, is hurtful and disrespectful and, you know, ultimately perpetuating racist stereotypes, first of all, I know this may be hard to believe now, but I think there's a possibility that the people who did it didn't understand how offensive it was. So, you know, I believe in giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. It might first be helpful to educate them about that, and they might sincerely repudiate and recant and apologize. I think if you immediately assume the worst and ostracize them and, and punish them, it's much less likely that they're going to change their views. They will presumably become embittered. And the article, uh, the uh, a piece by Jamel Bowie that, that I referred to said, you know, the most uh, effective strategy for dealing with the racist ideas 
would be education, especially appropriate at an educational institution. He said, you know, I've done my research. I live in New York, but I see that OU is two, about two hours from Tulsa. Take these students to, to Tulsa. You know, I have them confront the history of the Tulsa race riots and, you know, maybe talk to some people or whose ancestors were killed. And, you know, that will do more to raise their anti-racism consciousness by far than by taking a criminal approach. And if I can say just one other point here, we've had such, to me, such a positive momentum in this country recently across the political spectrum in favor of so-called restorative justice as opposed to the really harsh uh, punitive treatment that has been predominant in this country even for people who have been convicted even of violent crimes, including homicide, in the hope that we can reintegrate them as constructive members of our society. If we can have that kind of educational, restorative approach to people who have committed violence, then I think even more strongly we should have it toward people who have engaged in racist or other offensive speech. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. So in Oklahoma and many other states in the last year or so, there have been uh, new legislation enacted to um, prohibit parents and medical care providers from providing care for um, trans minors, and there's variations on this. Um, the ACLU is, I think, the lead plaintiff, at least in Oklahoma, and I wondered if you could say a little bit about <laughs> how this connects to the First amend Amendment. Oh, thank you for that last part because, you know, when I was ACLU president, I had to be a quasi-expert or pretend expert on every single issue on the ACLU's very broad docket, but in the last seven years, I've really focused on free speech. But there is, so I can't, you know, I have followed as much as you have, but no, you probably know more about the specific issues. Uh, but on the free speech connection, there definitely is one because, um, at least in terms of self-censorship, but I've read examples of university censorship punishing professors and students for voicing ideas um, on these issues that are politically unpopular within that particular community, and that is very troubling. And to cite one example, uh, for the last four years, FIRE and College Pulse have been doing a very detailed survey of hundreds of college campuses about the free speech climate. The most recent one came out just a couple of months ago, surveying 248 campuses. And self-censorship is rampant. And one of the subjects about which 40% of students everywhere say that they cannot have a candid and frank discussion on their campus, uh, either in classrooms, either in conversations with faculty members, or in conversations with other students, one of those topics is transgender issues. By the way, another one of those topics is abortion, another one is gun control and gun owners' rights, and another one are police issues. So, you know, these are the issues where we would, whatever the correct policy response is going to be, I don't think we can figure out what the correct policy response is going to be, what the truth is, to go to your question, unless we can have unfettered discussion, candid and frank discussion. Okay, let me welcome President Harris back to stage, and let's all say thank you to Nadine, for being here with us. And to Jeremy, and to all of you for your questions. All right, thank you very much. That's exactly the conversation I hope we would have. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Bailey, thank you so much for the time and energy and your leadership. Let's please again congratulate Dr. Jeremy Bailey. Yeah, a great op-ed, no question. And. Um, Nadine, I know we're going to go and do a podcast here in a little bit. Uh, I also know we have time issues here because of classes and the like. One of the things that you said, though, I want to note in particular, and that is the ability to have candid and frank discussions uh, and how difficult that can be even on a college campus, the very place where the search for truth has to be available and must take place. 
Right? That's why we celebrate free, you know, free speech week, this idea that, that for a democracy to function properly um, and for a university to move forward in its place, the difficult conversations have to happen and we have to all go in with the mindset that we don't know everything, that we can learn from somebody else, that their humanity exists just like ours. Right? That is the search for the truth, not the dictate for the truth. So thank you for your leadership, uh, for the career of service that you have. Um, and let's all please conclude by thanking Nadine Strassen.